Good evening. I hope you'll excuse me if I appear a trifle excited, but I've just come into possession of a cure for insomnia. It comes in capsule form. For best results, they must be taken internally. Here is the handy applicator. It is an amazingly simple device. An idiot can operate it, and indeed many do. Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's good, Jacob. How are you? Good. Doing well. Just loving the uh, cooler weather from a hundred and plus weather. That was not fun. Not fun at all. No. So how's it been, man? How you been? I'm great. I just picked up and moved halfway across the country and now I uh I got another job and that's going well and I'm just I'm making it. I'm making it. I haven't had the time to stream myself and it's got it got pretty bad there where I didn't have time to even watch anybody stream or support anybody by being in the chat and everything. It's just life got hectic there for a second, you know? And uh, but yeah. now it's starting yeah. to starting to calm back down and I really appreciate being invited back. Yeah, man. Good to have you on. Uh yeah, that, that's a that's a pretty big big move there. Yeah. What yeah. From Arkansas to Carolina. North Carolina. North mm -hmm. Carolina. Whew. Exciting. So. Exciting. Cool. Sometimes it's it's a little too exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you could come on for this one. This this will be fun. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, and oh. Matt should be should be on. I don't know where he is, but he he may come in a little bit later. So, but yeah, yeah. This, I mean the the man the man lived an insane life. Hitchcock, he did. 1899. To 1980, he experienced the the silver screen. He experienced going from silent movies to talkies, yeah. And he sh helped shape that. Like he did, yeah. Pretty, he, pretty crazy. Yeah, he was. He was actually. He was born in the East End, in the same area. Jack the Ripper did his. Mm -hmm. Uh, killings. It's like two decades after that he was born, or Alfred Hitchcock was born. So he he grew up in that. I mean, that's that's probably still talked about in that time frame too. So he probably grew up hearing stories about it. Yep. Like, don't go out late at night, or Jack's gonna get you, or something like that. Yeah. And it's <laughs> just that that had to have shaped his oh, yeah. upbringing, yeah. as as well as like, of course. Uh, the the political climate of the time with Great Britain being as much of a powerhouse as it was and then going into World War One and the aftermath of that it, it that just oh, yeah very similar to all of the artists and authors and writers of that time it it shaped their outlook on life and it shaped like their, their humor and it shaped their um, delivery of, of messages. And you can definitely tell that he was, I'm not going to say obsessed with the macabre, but he was definitely uh, an enjoyer of that, of, of that. Yes. genre. Yeah. There's even stories his his dad was kind of a disciplinary, you know, mm -hmm. kind of heavy, and he he sent Alfred to the uh, the police station with a note, telling him that he's been you know in trouble and he needs to sit in a jail cell for a few minutes. <laughs> oh my word! <laughs> yeah. I think I, yeah, I think I've heard about that where where he sent him like uh, he did something like he was just misbehaving, I believe, and yeah. Then his dad sends him with a note to go to jail. It's it's real life monopoly is what it was. Yeah. Yeah, and that that said it gave him uh what is it? Uh 
claustrophobia. <laughs> Claustro so, of course yeah. it would have. <laughs> Sending a small child to go to a jail cell. It'll make a claustrophobic yeah. <laughs> out of any person. Yeah. So yeah, so let's uh, actually read a little bit of his biography and then we'll jump into okay. the, the uh meat of the show. So I'll pull this up here. There we go. Let's see here. All right. So yeah, Al Sir Alfred Hitchcock. You gotta remember he's he's a knight. Was born in August 13th, 1899, London, England. And he passed away in 1980 in California. So, yeah, this is where it kind of tells his early life. Hitchcock grew up in London's East End in a Malieu, once haunted by the notorious serial killer known as Jack the Ripper talk of whom was still current in Hitchcock's youth two decades later. Although he had two siblings, he recalled his youth as a lonely one with a father who was stern disciplinarian. It is said that he once ordered Alfred to appear at the local police station with a note saying that he had been misbehaving, whereupon the sergeant on duty at the request of Alfred of Hitchcock's father, locked him up for a few minutes, a sufficient length of time to give Alfred Hitchcock a fear of enclosed spaces and a strong concern for wrongful imprisonment, both of which would figure in his later work. And that's true. You know, he, there's a lot of his stories that are, you know, there's someone wrongfully accused and they're trying to, you know, get mm -hmm. themselves off so it's, it's a common cool. trope for him and yeah i'm just looking through a list of his movies and i'm just like okay that that person was wrongly accused that person was wrongly accused so yeah that was pretty cool just i just wanted to read that little early life part and we'll get into this. I, I do have a look in looking for, you know, a a uh, list of his movies to talk about. They're all like, oh, the best, the 15 best Alfred Hitchcock or the, the 10 best or and it's like what they're they're all good. Including his, his yeah, uh, like, TV show. <laughs> I, I uh, now I'm going to be honest. I haven't seen most of his films, but I have seen a lot of like his quote unquote best films. And right. quite frankly, I can't, I can compare to catch a thief. I can compare that with, let's say psycho or the birds, but you, you can't do a one-to-one -one comparison. Like no. you can, you can pick out themes, you can pick out tropes, you can you can judge based on the acting, you can judge based on the uh, cinematography of it all, you can judge based on the soundtrack, but you really can't judge Hitchcock against Hitchcock. And so yeah. I don't I, I don't say that Psycho is better than the rear window. I, I just don't do that. I say they're both good films. You should watch them both. Yeah, and, and sure, some are, you know, more uh, recognizable than others, and some are more popular than others, but uh, they all have really good stories and, and really good uh, suspense, including the old ones, you know, the, the black and white, early 30s, and late 30s. And you see the evolution of cinematography as well, like in general. And you see how he grew as a director from when he started in the 30s to where he ended with 
psycho even like just take those three decades and you will see how he grew as a writer and you you see how he grew as a director and and yeah the guy was probably not the best human being (laughs) i know that a lot of people wanted to try and like smear his image by saying that he was just a a horrible mean old man and yeah that's called being human like you're not going to get along with everybody. And if you're in a position of power, sometimes you're not going to be a good person when you're in that position of power. And no, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just saying, yeah, it happened. I'm, I'm not going to not watch psycho because he was a bad person. It's, (laughs) it's well, bad person. What I mean, mean, that's all subjective as well. Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I did hear he was he did play mean tricks on his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> one being one being he he encouraged her to go on a carousel and then turned it off when she was at the very top of it. Oh <laughs> oh no. Yeah, that that was pretty mean. <laughs> now now we can all agree that that is both funny and mean. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So there's the man, the legend, and the, a crow by him. So Alfred Hitchcock was the master of suspense, and he was also a master of comedy, romance, and horror. To name a few, many great artists go unappreciated during their lifetimes, but audiences flocked to Hitch- Alfred Hitchcock's movies for six decades, revealing in, revealing in the excitement. Reveling in the excitement, sorry. Uh, Hitchcock died peacefully in his sleep at his home in Bel Air in April 1980, leaving behind one of the most illustrious legacies in film history. To celebrate the filmmaker's impeccable career, we ranked the 15 15 of his movies. I'm not going to say best because there's a bunch of them. There we go. So in the, the first, uh, I enjoy playing the audience like a piano, Alfred Hitchcock. That's a good one. <laughs> and this one, To Catch a Thief, was the is the first one. So, so you've never seen this one? Uh, no, my mother's seen it and she talks about it all the time because she loves Hitchcock. But I... Never like I didn't grow up on Hitchcock. She didn't like sit me down and like watch these right. movies because these are good movies. No, she she likes what she likes and she just talks about it. And so I've heard about most of these movies uh, because yeah. my mother my mother would grow like she grew up on these movies, like movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s. And that's what her grand like what my what my grandmother, her mother would watch and she would always just have it on the television. And so she, it just kind of naturally exposed her to um, Hitchcock, to Gregory Peck, to uh, James Stewart, uh, all of these actors and directors. And so it kind of shaped her taste in mute movies. And yeah, I, I remember like if I've watched a Hitchcock movie, it was with my mother. You know, and so I remember watching Psycho. Imagine like a nine year old watching Psycho, not knowing what it's about. And (laughs) mom just says, I'm going to pop a movie on you. Uh, I'm going to make you dinner. Like you're going to eat whatever you want. Like do you like whatever you want? I'll make it for you. And I was like, "Okay, great. And uh, but we're going to watch a movie. And so we sit down and we're watching this and it gets to the 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 big reveal that the that spoiler alert for a very old <laughs> movie that the mother's dead and like you turn around and like, it's just a skeleton. And yeah. My mother, my mother just cackles and I'm freaking out. <laughs> and it turns out that that's not the first time that that 
has that that little move right there, like cackling at the the apex of the movie in my family at least, because that happened to a cousin of mine with my grandmother who did the same thing to him, <laughs> and I apparently had a better reaction than my cousin did because my cousin got up and ran straight for the bathroom and sat there sobbing while my grandmother laughed <laughs> at 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 her grandson, just laughing at her grandson because she scared him so much, like. Yeah. Oh. Alfred funny. Hitchcock does that to families. He does. Yo, Copa. Glad you're here, man. So yeah, to catch a thief, I'll just read the read the description of it real quick. Right after rear window, Hitchcock reunited with Grace Kelly for the breezer enchanting to breezer enchanting to catch a thief based on the 1952 novel of the same name. Comedic Caper also stars Cary Grant as the reformed cat burglar, attempting to catch the imitator as he woos the beautiful daughter of a wealthy widow. To Catch a Thief is lighter Hitchcock, but this is still a master firing on all cylinders. To Catch a Thief is Im impossibly elegant, sexy, and charming in a way that can simply never be replicated due to the talent involved. So yeah, there's that one. Have you seen this uh, movie? That, I just, I just got to add that to the list then. That's what I got. Yes. Do. Yes, that's a good one. Uh, the Man Who Knew Too Much? Yes, I have actually. Because uh, I, uh, I, I enjoy watching James Stewart Yes, me too. Hey, Flaccid. How you doing, Flaccid? So, yeah, do you have any memories of this one when you saw it? No, nothing as funny as Psycho. Like that, that, that is just the cream of the crop. Like, uh, there was, uh, there's a memory about Psycho, and then not a not a Hitchcock movie, but Misery with. Uh, Oh yeah. Oh, what's yeah. her name? But like, it was always like those psychological thrillers that my mother had already watched, and yeah. then she knows the exact part that it's going to happen, and so she could just bam, and and get me. <laughs> yeah, this kid reminded me of Leave It to Beaver mm -hmm, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, this is. I thought this was a good movie. Very suspenseful. I mean, their, their kid gets kidnapped and they're like trying to find him. It's a good one. See, so yeah, the this is this is the one time in six decades that Hitchcock remake remade his own work. The man who knew too much was uh, much is a reworking of Hitch's 1934 British film the same of the same name. Both are genuinely great thrillers. In the remake of Magist Oh, okay. Mega stars uh, James Stewart and Doris Day are re um, re are riveting, riveting and sympathetic riveting. and desperate p parents seeking their kidnapped son. They're the where are we? They're Innocent people who unwittingly become entangled in an international assassination plot. Whatever will be, will be. Won mm -hmm. an Oscar or and for best original song. Uh, the big scene. What is that? A splashy, emotional music driven and dialogue free final at the Royal Albert Hall. In an, is it? Operatic in the best sense of the word. Yeah, that whole scene was great. It's like you've heard heard this music that they're gonna play, and they're like, when the when the big symbols uh, hit, that's when you shoot. And we're like, oh, oh, it's getting closer. It's really really epic the way he can uh, get use to the music climax to do and, that. and really. Yeah really like ha make it have an impact on you 
as the viewer. Yeah. Right. Hey, Corey. Hey, what's up, Corey? This one I haven't seen in a long time. Spellbound. I yeah, that that's new to me. I I, I must have completely skipped over this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think Gregory Peck was in many Alfred Hitchcocks. Yeah, so Gregory Peck and Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman are characteristically spellbinding in an Oscar winning mystery about a psychologic a psychologist who falls for an amnesiac who may or may not be a murderer. Spellbound doesn't measure up to immediate scursive way. Uh, successor notorious, but it's still a must must see for any fan of the director or classic films in general. It's a strange, uneven, and often breathtaking film. Iconic artistic flourishes include a dream sequence designed by Silver Silver Door Dolly and a climactic shot uh, staring straight down the barrel of a loaded gun. Oh, yeah, well, I, I got to see that now. That sounds like a great shot. Hey, Roman. Hey, How's Roman. How's it going? Oh, Cope is already after after Roman. <laughs> so, yeah, Rope. So, you haven't seen Rope either, huh? Nope, haven't seen Rope. I am just failing. <laughs> I'm on a podcast about Alfred Hitchcock and I haven't seen his millions of movies. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, he, there's a bunch, but you know, they do get to ones that more people have seen in this article. But yeah, yeah, rope is an interesting one. So uh Rope stands out in as the black sheep of Hitchcock's most famous films, and it's only gotten better with age. Uh, Fairly Granger and John Dahl star as preppy youths, greatly or er, overtly gay characters who just barely made it past the censor board, who commit a murder mainly for a thrill and Jimmy Stewart plays the only man who can unravel their sick plan. The thriller is shot to resemble one long take, an exceptionally difficult feat in 1948, with a handful of obvious cuts transpiring in, a real, t in real time. Rope is a master of suspense... Uh, suspense... Sorry. Master of suspenses... Most, most underrated picture. A bold look at uh, post-war morality. These days, Rope is looking damn close to a masterpiece status. So I don't know if I've seen this one. Rebecca. How about you? You know my answer. You know my answer to that one already. <laughs> Like I, I maybe, maybe it was on in the background when I was younger. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's got Lawrence Olivier and Joan Fontaine. So I imagine that m my family has probably watched it, just not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't remember it either. So I, I may have not seen it. Uh, so Copa says based... that Rebecca's a good one. So okay. Oh, so it's based on a Daphne de Moore's. Sorry if I butchered that. Bestseller uh, Rebecca is about a plain woman who wins the heart of a cynical widower. Rebecca's romantic leads, Lawrence Olivier and John Fontaine, are perfectly cast and the story about a couple haunted by ghosts of the past 
is as riveting as it over as ever more than 80 years later gone with the wind mega producer david o selznick was also part of the talent behind this gripping masterwork that satisfies as both a romantic and a psychological thriller it was hitchcock's first big hollywood film and it won the academy award for best picture the innovation at uh, George Burns Barnes deliciously gothic cinematic cinematography also won the Academy Award. The film's very uh, climax climax provides just the right amount of payoff. And another quote, the only way to get rid of my fears is to make films about them. Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, and here we go. The birds. The birds. I remember watching this. This I didn't like this movie at all growing you up. Didn't. At all. I hated it so much. It's actually I don't like birds because of this. Like whenever <laughs> I see like a large gathering of birds, I'm just like, those things are gonna attack me. Yes. Oh, that, that scene of all the little kids running down the street. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's right in the forefront of my mind whenever I see a, a gigantic flock of birds, yes. and I I'm just okay. I'm gonna turn around now and walk the other way. You guys didn't see me. <laughs> yeah, that was and that wouldn't Roman that wouldn't gets scar it. a little Roman kid. gets it. Birds aren't real. Roman gets it. Yeah, birds aren't real. They're 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 uh. Robots. That's what they are. <laughs> They're government drones sent to yes, spy on us. Yes. Oh. <laughs> now that would be a Hitchcock movie. If Hitchcock was alive today, he would have so much fun. He would. Yeah, he would. Uh, yeah, that that whole scene of the they're in the school and they're looking out the window and the birds gathering. It's like, just stay inside. Don't go outside. So yeah, the the birds. And you know, the, out of all of this, like all the movies that I've seen as lists so far that I've seen, I have no problems with the writing. I have no problems with the plot. I have no problems with the acting. I have no problems with the shots that they have for to make the movie. Uh, it's just they're they're not ten out of tens, but they really like to me. Birds, easy seven and a half or higher. Depending on like how I'm feeling, sometimes yeah. I'll think, "Oh, this movie's like an eight out of 10. Yeah, Roman says the birds is a way better version of the happening. Yes, which I agree. I agree. I mean, it it is kind of there are a few places in it that are a little corny, but it's still good. So yeah, the birds at the zenith of his popularity, a filmmaker, a filmmaking craft, Hitchcock uh, mined enormous thrills from a very slim, another uh, Daphne Demure novel. I think that's uh, Daphne. Daphne. Daph Daphne Du Maurier. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. About nature gone to hell. Yep, it does. It goes to hell. Yeah, it does. If the birds doesn't have the psychological depth of some of the director's other biggest hits, it's a timeless showcase of his technical prowess. A mini masterpiece of tension sees a small army of birds gather on a climbing frame behind our unaware heroine. It makes you want to yell at the screen go back inside yeah yeah i don't i don't I, I don't know how many times that i've done that at movies where there's just there's that like what they said that tension and it's just like why are you going into that house you know that you're probably gonna die if you go there why are you going why are you going outside stay <laughs> inside inside is protective Yes. Don't go in that yes. basement. That basement only brings death. 
the, also some of the scenes kind of reminded me of uh, signs where the aliens are trying to get in the house. Yes, yes. That's so, another yeah, good movie. That, that isn't a good movie. So thirty nine, the thirty nine steps. Have you have you seen this one? <laughs> no, I know it, it's an older one, and probably a lot of people haven't seen it. But it's it's a good one. Good, good actor too. Uh, yeah, John John uh, John Buchan, uh, the the adventure novel of the same name by John Buchan. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, it's a nineteen fifteen adventure novel. You know what? Yeah, I'm gonna look that up right now. Just see what it. Uh, cool. Okay. I'll read the description while you're while you're doing that. All right. Though Hitchcock had been directing films for nearly a decade, his first film was *The Lodger*, a story of a London fog of the London fog in 1926. *The Thirty Nine Steps* is his first masterpiece, based on the 1915 adventure novel of the same name by John. Uh, Buchane about an every man civilian Robert uh, Donet who is unwittingly entangled in an international espionage plot wrongfully accused man forced to clear his clear their names were a staple Hitchcock's films a staple of Hitchcock's films. The 39 Steps was a, a smash hit in its day and a firmly established Hitchcock as uh, the master of the thriller. In 1999, the British Film Institute ranked it as the fourth best British film of the 20th century. Yep, that is a good one. Huh, that's interesting. I, I am I am uh first I'm gonna give the novel a read and then I'm gonna go ahead and watch that because that uh that sounds interesting. I, I like that that little blurb they have for it. Huh. Neat. Alright, now we got the lady vanishes, huh? Yes. First I'm gonna look up this actor first. Alright. He he was a he was a good actor. In his time, if that's the right dude. Uh, hang on just a second. Sorry. It's all good. Yeah, he was a, a really good actor. Uh, he played in a, another movie where he dressed up like an old, where he, they dressed him up old. Yeah. Yeah, he's best remembered for that role, the uh, uh, Thirty Nine Steps. But yeah, he was he was in a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Goodbye, Mister Chips. That was that was a good movie, an old one. He was in the the Count of Monte Cristo, an old version of that. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, he's Edmond Dantes in it, so that's cool. Yeah, he was he was a good actor. Here's him dressed up as an old dude, which is pretty good makeup for back then. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and the next one is the lady vanishes. This one happens on a train too. So it's like a lot of his he's got a few movies that have that take place on trains. So you have, you've not seen this one? No. 
No. <laughs> We're going to get to some that I've seen and some that I have We haven't. will. We will soon. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Where's Matt? I'm sure he's seen some. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, The Lady Vanishes is uh, Hitchcock's uh, penultimate film in his uh, native uh, Britain before a shift to Hollywood is the best work of his early period based on the 1936 novel, The Wheel Spins. It's a perfectly placed story about the English tourist, Margaret Lockwood, who stumbles into a conspiracy as she pursues a missing elderly traveler companion. The Lady Vanishes blends humor, romance, and suspense in even measure, in even measure comparable to North by Northwest. Hitchcock was always cogniz cognizant of the world around him. The Lady Vanishes clearly depicts pre-war politics in this background. Yeah, so that's a good one, too. An oldie but a goodie. I've just okay, got, here like, we go. It, it's almost like, oh, I have so much homework to do. The next time we talk about Hitchcock, it's just... <laughs> So this one, this one's good, and you've seen this one, I think, right? Yes, I have seen this one. Surprisingly, and it, you know, it also brings it down to like a, a normal people. A lot of these are like people traveling all over, and they're mm -hmm. you know wealthy, or but this one is just a regular family, mm -hmm. and it's just really, really good. See, so it you really don't know what what's going on at first and that's really good but it it, it grabs you from the beginning mm -hmm. i think and so and we, i i would have to agree that um it is a very very compelling hero villain dynamic throughout all of his work now of course this is coming from somebody that hasn't seen all of his work but from what i have seen like with psycho or with the rear window, like there's always some form of dynamic between, you know, the good guy and the supposed bad guy. And I really like how it was, it was, uh, the, the uncle. Yeah. And like you, that's something that you could just read about in the news today. Like a young girl d discovers that her uncle is just, to serial killer like a crazy person it's very it's very believable and and that's that's what i think made hitchcock so famous was all of his all of his uh movies were relatable to the normal like everyday man yeah hello there him. Welcome. Yeah, this I, I really like this one. It's, it actually has another train in it. So yes, yeah, so shadow of a doubt. The idea of pure evil hiding out in a small American town was novel in 1934 or 1943. In Hitchcock's favorite of his own films, co-written by uh, Thornton Wilder, Shadow of a Doubt is a still a deeply creepy film to this day, starring fresh-faced uh, Teresa Wright as a young girl who slowly discovers her dear uncle Charlie's, Charlie's Joseph Cotton, played by Joseph Cotton, sinister, sinister past. Spoiler, he's a serial killer. It's the most compelling hero-villain dynamic in all of Hitchcock's work. Once again, Hitchcock's, Hitchcock freaks out the audience by getting a well-liked star to play, the, play against type as twisted. Okay. Hitchcock freaks out the audience by getting a well-liked star to play against 
type as a twisted villain. Cotton is mesmerizing. Another in innovation is the idyllic small town America setting. This backdrop wasn't ex exploited for horror until the slasher craze decades later, beginning with Halloween. Yeah, Peter Cotton's another good actor, too. Mm hmm. And here we go Strangers on a Train. How about that one? Have you seen that one? I have seen that one. It's a good one. Hey, Cannoli. And you see, that's that's like when <sighs> we as presenters of our opinions, I'm horrible at that. I'm horrible at saying like, this movie is astounding and here's why. <laughs> the, it's astounding because the cinematography is just fantastic. No, I'm just like, it's good. It's good. I enjoyed yeah. it. Like, why did you enjoy it? I just liked it. It, it just hit all the, the right buttons, and then I was gave it a thumbs up. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, that, that, that's the type of uh, moviegoer that I am. I, I go see a movie, and if I like it, I'm just like, it's good. But yeah. this one, this one, I, I do enjoy it. I've uh, probably seen it. Uh, I know I've seen Psycho the most out of all of his works. I've watched Psycho probably five times. Um, and each time that I watch Psycho, there's something else that creeps me out about the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this one, I think I've only seen it twice. I've only seen it twice. And... I mean, they're not wrong by saying the film has aged beautifully. They're not wrong. Uh, yeah. I... I I do think that back then they made movies to withstand the test of time and they tell a story and it's just like, you don't know who's president at this time. You don't know what kind of war or conflict is going on at this time. That's unimportant. What's important is the characters and the setting. And, and what these characters do. That's important. And yeah. I think that, on, on, at least for this movie, uh, Hitchcock did a great job. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole scene where they meet, too. It's like, this guy's crazy. You can, you can already tell there's something not quite right about this dude. And it's like, and he gets him, would you, would you like to go in my private cabin and have, have lunch? It's like, no, don't do it. Don't go in there. <laughs> Stranger danger. Yes. But yeah, for those of you that haven't seen it, you got to see this movie. It's a great movie. A misunderstanding between young tennis player, Farley Granger, and the charismatic psychopath, Robert Walker, leads to a swirling mess of murder and men menace in one of the Hitchcock's most stylish and perfectly paced thrill rides. The hair raising final uh, fittingly, fittingly takes place on an out of control carnival ride based on the 1950 uh, Patricia Highsmith, Highsmith novel of the same name. Strangers had a somewhat mixed reception upon release with a with some criticizing its sordid storyline which was twisted even by hitchcock's standard hitch's standards it's also a uh, darkly hilarious the film has aged beautifully with hitchcock's bold and dazzling stylistic choices picked apart in film schools across the world but its edgy and morbid take on human nature has been reflected in more modern works like Fargo. Uh, a simple plan and gone girl. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Rear window. Oh, yeah. 
good old Jimmy Stewart. Yep. I remember the first time I watched this, I had no idea what was going on. I was just like, what? What? What was happening? And and then the twist happens. And I'm like, this movie's awesome. And I, yeah. I think I I think I immediately rewatched it. And then I picked up on some things that I missed before. But it's been I would I would say about ten years since I've seen this movie. I need to do a rewatch of it. Hello, Pender Pender Jit. Welcome. Hey, welcome. So yeah, I mean, can you imagine being, you know, immobilized, stuck in one room with a window, you know, and how for months you'd how bored you would get, you know? I don't want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can I can only imagine how insane that I would get. Like there, there's no doubt every single noise, every single movement, every single like oddly placed object, I would think, oh, well, there's got to be a story behind that. Let's watch this for 12 hours straight. Yeah, <laughs> I got nothing but time to kill. Yep. And he's I mean, he's a photographer, so he's a he's traveled the world and now he's just stuck in a room and no TV. I don't think he ever plays the radio. <laughs> nope. At yeah. least nowadays you would have something to entertain yourself. Yeah. But back then it really was the radio at that time. It really it and books. Just was that and books. Yeah. Hey Teresa. Hey, Miss Mart Muses. North yes. by Northwest. Um, let's see. What? I want to say that I have seen this. I want to say that I have seen it, but I can't say that I remember it. Yeah, the the climax of it is there on top of the uh, Mount Rushmore. And I, remember I, that? I, I just, I feel like I've seen that before. Them on Mount Rushmore clinging to each other. I mean, it's a, a pretty well-known, you know, clip. I mean, you could, you could have seen it anywhere, really. But yeah, it, let's, let's read it. Maybe it'll spark a memory or something. Hitchcock often explored wrong man plots where innocent, everyday, every, every man accused of Heinous crimes are racing to clear their names. The best of these is North by Northwest. As a kinetic set piece laden. What? Hmm. A kinetic. That didn't make any sense. A set, set piece laden uh, per, precursor to the Bond series. Yeah, it has. It does have a, a lot of you know, James Bond tropes in it with hilarious, perfectly paced script by Ernest Lehman, the big, uh, Adam Roger Thornhill, Cary Grant being trailed by a crop dusting airplane in the open field is iconic. And so is the Thornhill and Eve Kindle's Eva Marie Saint foot chase down the, the crevices of Mount Rushmore. Nope. Not sparking any memories. I, no. <laughs> I, I, I might've watched it, but I probably didn't like it. So I probably, I, I don't know. Oh, you'd love it. I think you'd love it. If you have seen uh, it, you would, you would have remembered more homework. it. It's, more homework. Yes. <laughs> Funny note, Jess, uh, Jesse Royce Landis played Cary Grant's mother in the movie even though she was just eight years older than him. <laughs> now that, yeah, that's funny. Now she was also in uh, To Catch a Thief, too. Oh, here it is. Here's, here's, here it is. Here's your movie. The best one. This is the best <laughs> of the best. 
So, how many times have you seen this? Probably like five times. Okay. I like the more I watch it, the less I feel bad for the woman. I forget her name, uh, but because like she's she's running away, and <laughs> then she just so yeah. happens to go to the worst place. Yeah, ever. she's. I think she stole something, right? Yeah, she stole. Um, oh, it's been. I th- I'm pretty sure that she was. Now, chat. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. But I'm pretty sure she was cheating on her husband, and then ran away with a bunch of money. I'm pretty yeah, and- sure that that was the start <laughs> of the movie. Yeah, and she just has the misfortune of running into a crazy psycho killer. <laughs> So, yes, this is where modern horror begins. Oh, I, based I, on the, I agree. Uh, at least, yeah. at least modern horror that made it to the mainstream. Everyone was talking about it. It was, a, it was a gigantic hit. Yeah. It's based on another Robert Naval or uh, Robert Botch, Blotch. Her novel, Hitchcock's most uh, most uh, most famous and most pro- what is that profitable? Profitable, yes. Profitable thriller. I don't mm-hmm. get that. He made a lot of money off of it. Oh right, okay, I get it now. Is about a young woman named Mary Crane, played by Janet Mar- Lee. Yep, Marion Crane. Yes, that's it. Mm-hmm. On the run with forty thousand dollars who makes an unfortunate detour to the Bates Motel. Anthony Perkins delivers his most iconic role, the heart throb playing against type as Norman Bates. Uh, Vera Miles plays Moraine's sister, Leela. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and oh man, he's who he plays a good Plays a Psycho. very, very good. Yeah. The terrifying shower scene kills off our main character halfway through the film. It's likely the most famous and un- analyzed, se- or analyzed sequence in film history. It's even the subject of future length documentary 7852. Yeah, it, it's a it's a good one. Now this one really isn't really my one of my uh, favorites, but it's still good. You ever, you, have you seen this one, Vertigo? Vertigo, no, no. Hmm. Okay, there- let's see. Yeah, so it's 1958, Vertigo. so it's two years before Psycho. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If Psycho is Hitchcock's most iconic film, Vertigo is perhaps his most critically admired. A work of, lay- of layered genius, a tale of romantic ob- obser- observation. What? Obsession. Sorry. Brain not working. A Tale of Romantic Obsession stars James Stewart, again against a type as a troubled private investigator, John Satty Ferguson, who falls for a stunning blonde, Kim Novak, who's obsessed with death. Barbara Bell Giddies plays Midge, uh, Scotty's best friend. Uh, Bernard Her- Herman's score heightens the atmosphere. Vertigo feels con- confession? confessional. Perhaps the master's most personal picture. Perhaps the huh. master's most personal picture. Okay. That, that sounds interesting. That definitely sounds interesting. I mean, a private investigator already like i'm intrigued and he's got Uh, vertigo yeah and he has vertigo 
Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, more homework. <laughs> that's all I'm. Yeah. That's all I'm seeing. The vertigo effect consists of moving the camera while zooming out, where the back foreground stays in one position while the background grows and shrinks. Yes, it's it's very off-putting effect, too, especially if you have a big screen watching it. But yeah, it's another good one. It's another good one. It should be on your it it put it on your list. I will. Arc. I will. Yeah. And and I have I have a, a rather large list that's growing day by day, and I've probably added five movies just now. <laughs> oh, I. I've got, I've got tons of movies waiting to watch. <laughs> and it's like, I don't have to watch the latest thing that's come out. That, that's what I like. There are so many movies by so many different directors, so many different stylistic choices to choose from. And, and all the, the, and so many different styles within the vast variety of genres that I don't have to watch the latest thing. I don't have to watch, like, I don't have to keep up with with the latest TV show or the latest movie series. Uh, I just don't have to do it. I don't have to watch Marvel movies. I don't have to watch DC no. Comics movies. Like, uh, no. I don't have to watch the latest Star Wars movies or TV shows. No. I could go back and I can watch things that have been lauded as great works of art. And then I get to experience it for the first time. Like yeah. I'm going to watch Vertigo for the first time. I don't know what it's like. I just know that it's a private investigator. He falls He falls for a stunning blonde. Okay, that's a common thing in movies. You have a beautiful yeah. woman. Uh, and, okay, and, a common, oh. and a common thing with Alfred Hitchcock too. Yeah. So it's just I, I like this director. I like the way that he creates movies. I'm pretty sure I'm going to enjoy Vertigo. And that, that just means that I'm going to watch it. Simple. Yeah. So Notorious. Have you seen Notorious? I have. I have. Very yes. good movie. One of my favorites. One of, Another one of my favorites. Basically, most of Hitchcock are favorites. So, yeah. I, I Harry Grant like and it. Ingrid Bergman. Like he always chooses for his main characters, like an out almost an almost outlandish, like uh, profession for them. Like with Vertigo, you see that he's a private investigator, but with this one, it's about American spies. Yeah, and I love that. I just I, yeah, I really so like good. that. Yeah, and good 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 chemistry between Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the, I'll just read this real quick. So Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman are as radiant as movie stars can be in Hitchcock's finest love story, an espionage picture about American spies infiltrating a Nazi ring, a, infiltrating a ring of Nazis sympathizers in post-war South America. Notorious is more subtle than some of Hitchcock's later work, but it it's a great A film as a as he ever made. Uh, ben Hitchens script presents a love triangle that's just as compelling as the one in Casablanca and far more sinister, full of warm and gorgeous close ups in innovative but na Ah, innovative but never in intrusive, intrusive camera work. Notorious is pure cinema. Hitchcock always had an appreciation for pushing the envelope and the, uh, the envelope and the censors. An early scene gleefully skirts around the old censorship codes that banned on-screen kisses of more than three seconds. By having Grant and Bergman's swap short smooches <laughs> for uh, nearly three minutes, another remarkable crane shot takes the camera from a high ceiling directly into the palm of Bergman's uh, 
clutched hand where's there's an important key in the hand in that hand mm-hmm. yeah that's a great that is such a great shot i love that shot mm-hmm. I, it's just Uh-oh. you get so much from those like i've always loved crane shots like bird's eye view shots if you want to use that in movies because there's always something that it wants to show you whenever they have a shot like that. Always. Um, I, yeah. I can't, I can't say that I like notorious more than another uh, Hitchcock movie, but I, I like it just fine. It's, it's got romance. It's got uh, thrills. It's just, it's a good piece of cinema that you can just watch and get engrossed in the story. And then you want to watch it again. I've always said that rewatchability of movies should be the top priority of those creating the movies. You should want to have your audience rewatch your work. It shouldn't just be yeah, a right. once in a lifetime experience. It should be, a once in a lifetime experience to watch it the first time they want to watch it again. Yeah. That's what I've always thought. Yeah, me too. And not just, just filler movies. I mean, all we're getting is uh, filler movies. Just go consume this and move on to the Mm -hmm. next product. Uh, You, you have to, but before you watch this movie, you have to go uh, watch a three season TV show on this subscription service. And then you also have to read the graphic novel that ties into the, uh, uh, the, that ties into the uh, TV show that the TV show will then tie into a completely different movie that we haven't even made yet. But that movie relies on the first movie that we're releasing now. Now, did any of that, that I just said, make any sense? Yes. I think so. <laughs> I think it did, but that's what it feels like well, that's, nowadays. That's what it's like, though. It's confusing. It's like you you, you have a show and you don't even explain anything that's happened before, and you expect people to you know just know what you're talking about. Yep. Hey, Stephen. How's hey, it going, Stephen. Man? Hey there, Ian. How's it going? Hey, Ian. But Alfred didn't do that. You didn't have to watch a previous movie to understand a later movie. No. And that's what I like about Alfred. That's what I like about so many of these like late 40s to late 80s directors is they made movies because it was basically an art piece they were they were trying to tell a piece of art through moving pictures but nowadays you have to have a whole damn collage just to understand one aspect of of the story yeah i mean he's got 69 works that he's done or stuff he worked on that's a lot of movies that's a lot of movies have you seen Marnie? I have. Sean Connery? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. There's, there's there's a few movies that just, you know, he's, it's like Alfred Hitchcock gets his favorite actors, you know. So, yeah, Sean Connery oh, is in one of his uh, movies. It's very just similar to Scorsese, what Scorsese, Scorsese is doing now. He's just getting his favorite actors to play in his movies. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Tarantino is very lucky to have started doing that. Like he he got not well known actors, but he got some good actors, and then they became massive successes, and they continued to to star in his movies. He's got like right. a core group of people that are almost always in his movies. Yeah. Have you seen the wrong man? 
No. It's it's the only Hitchcock that's based that's based on a true story. The wrong man. Huh. I'm just writing all of these down right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's got uh, Henry Fonda, Beer Miles in it. Okay, okay. Yeah, he's a uh, bass player in a band at night. And uh, I guess it's a speakeasy, I think. But he gets arrested for murder that he didn't commit. Great, fantastic movie. Really good. Heart uh, gut wrenching at times. Well, yeah, we never really want to see movie. somebody get accused of something that they didn't do. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see that on anybody. That's and it's, just, you know, it's a, it's about just a regular guy who's working hard for his family and gets, gets accused of murder. All right, adding that to the list. But yeah, I ha- I haven't seen all of them. I mean, there's a bunch that I haven't seen. At some point, I would just like to start from the very beginning and just watch all of it. But yeah, that, that'd be a good a review movies. series right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm actually I am you know gone through a lot of them. Yeah, it'd, it'd be nice to start at the beginning and get the ones I haven't gotten. But yeah, that, that's a lot of movies. Plus, the he had two uh, series, too. Mm-hmm. Alfred Hitchcock Hour and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. So th- those were both good, too. Just short little uh, one-story series. It's great. I loved it's, his monologues at the start of them. Yeah, like like the one I started with. Mm-hmm. Hey, Jana. Hey, Jana. But yeah, Mr. Hitchcock. Great stuff. So, now what, what do we talk about now? Now what do we talk about? That is a good question. Uh, when was the first time you watched a uh, Hitchcock movie? Whew. That, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I've grown up watching classic movies, so it's like... I, I basically grew up with these movies. Yeah. I mean, yeah, pretty much grew up with these movies. So it's just, they've always been... I've always w- watched them and enjoyed them. Yeah, like I said, I think I was, for me at least, uh, the first movie that I watched of Hitchcock was uh, Psycho, I think at age nine, I think so. And yeah, that that was uh, that was definitely an experience to show a nine year old. Like, Thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah, it, it was probably either Rear Window or uh, who what was it? I just had it. Yeah, uh, North by Northwest. It was it was one of those two. That was probably one of the fir- one of the first ones. Was probably one of those two. Yeah, but man, it, the fir- the four movies that they show at the very top are Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo, and The Birds. No. Ima- imagine imagine mixing Vertigo and The Birds. No thanks. No thanks. Uh, let's see. So it's kind of it's kind of amazing that he is known for late fifties, early sixties movies when his he had he'd already been an established director at that time. He'd already been yeah. working for like three decades, and and yeah. then now he just like ex- exploded with those movies. Yeah. His last movie was Family Plot, which I've never seen that. I don't even know what that's about. Huh. 
Weird. Oh, well, now I have to watch that. It said a phony psychic con artist and her taxi driver <laughs> actor boyfriend encounter a pair of serial killers. No, oh, no. What? <laughs> that that description of the plot alone is that that is enough to make me want to watch it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen I haven't seen that one. So I may have to check that one out. Frenzy is another is one I've seen that's that's ew, it's pretty grisly. Mm-hmm. I actually I, his, I have seen Frenzy, but Hitchcock's later movies were, were pretty grisly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, well, this like they a, said, he 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 did love to push the envelope. Yeah. Yeah, this one's about a, a, a serial killer that strangles women with neckties. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, that, that one got a little, little uh, grisly. Yeah, the, what else we got here? Torn curtain. That's another good one. It's a Paul Newman, Paul Newman movie. It's a. Uh, let's see here. It's been a while since I've seen this one. An American scientist publicly defects to East Germany as part of a cloak and dagger mission to find the solution for a formula uh, formula right resin? formula resin resin it's, it's before like, uh, planning an escape back to the west yeah, yeah it's a good one it's a good one hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, Panduchit says, uh, family plot is interesting. If you track the interactions between the two couples, the same scenes play out with each couple. That is interesting. Hmm. That nice. does sound interesting. The Trouble with Harry. Have you seen that one? That one's probably his most comedic. No, I have not. I'm, I swear, I'm just writing these down. It's just like, oh, I haven't seen this, write it down. I haven't seen this, write it down. Yeah, people keep people keep finding this guy's body. And each person thinks they killed him. So each, each person that finds his body, they hide his body. So his body winds up all over the place. It's it's pretty good. Oh, no. It's a funny one. <laughs> And this one actually has uh, what's his name? The Beaver, Jerry Mathers. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Huh? Yeah, it's a good one. I like it. It's it's funny and comical at the same time. Good one. Suspicion. I don't think I've seen that one. It doesn't sound familiar. Have not seen that one. Uh, Dial in for murder. Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen that good one. Good one. That's a good one. Uh, stage fright. It sounds familiar, but I don't know if I've seen that one. Uh, kind of looking for one. Lifeboat. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, several survivors of a torpedoed merchant ship in World War II find themselves in the same lifeboat with one of the crew members of the U-boat that sank their ship. Yeah, great one. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Oh, uh, that was made in 44. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, where is it? And of course, you have the Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. Have you it's seen good. that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's another one I'm trying to find here. Uh, 
Must have overlooked. Now that we're getting yeah, but saboteur down to was, the 20s and 30s, I'm like, I haven't seen this one, this one, this one. I'm I'm looking yeah. at the scores and they're all getting like 6.7, like in, in the sixes or, or low sevens. And that's not a bad score. Like that's no, uh-uh. but it's just maybe not as popular as his. Well, let's just say it like the more famous ones that he's known for. Yeah. Saboteur is another good one. And foreign correspondent too. That's pretty good too. Okay. Yeah, but a, a young man accused of sabotage goes on the run to prove his innocence. It's always to prove your innocence. I I I think Hitchcock, I think Hitchcock was saying something. You think he was he was like trying to say that hey if I'm ever accused of a crime I didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> What's he saying here? Family plot is interesting if you track the interactions between the two couples, the same scenes play out with each other each couple. Okay, cool. Have to look at that. Check that one. Add it to the list. Yep. The ever growing list of, of Hitchcock movies. So that was that was good. I'm glad you could come on and talk about these. Great. Absolutely, great movies. Jacob. Thank you for yeah. having me on. Yeah, man. You you got anything you want to plug? Uh, well, if you want, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitter. That's at Arcasool. I'm I'm at Arcasool basically everywhere on social media. So if you see if you see something that looks like this face right here, go ahead and follow <laughs> it. Um, okay. I uh, I don't I don't really have a stream schedule right now. Uh, life is kind of up in the air. Like like I said before. Uh, if I do stream, it's probably because I have an abundance of free time, which I am thankful for getting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's always it's always fun to pop into your chats and to listen to the discussions, Jacob. I'm I'm really happy that you passed one year on on YouTube, well, you. and I just I want to see you keep going, dude. It, it's it's always 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 a good time. Uh, on your channel, whether that's as a panelist or in the chat. So thank you, Jacob. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. I've, uh, the, I've got two things coming up. I've got uh, a review on the movie in the heat of the night on Tuesday, and I will be on Roman of the empire's channel and continuing to talk about the, Oh, the, the great, the not so great show. So Oh, but I heard that yeah. Dave Filoni's changing like the face of cinematography with that show. Yes, he I saved heard. he saved Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! I haven't even watched it. I, I'm not gonna watch Ahsoka. I'm just yeah, not don't, gonna. Don't don't but do it. I I just they chose they chose a character that Dave created to. Yeah. basically make her the focal point for everything happening in Star Wars and I'm just like why even even that him saying that he created the character well, he didn't create the character he told people hey create me a character and then he took all the credit for it yeah pretty much and now he's ruining that character what uh, little there was of that character yeah. But you can look forward to that. What what is it? It's on Thursdays, right? Yeah, uh yep, Thursdays on Roman of the Empire's channel. That's always a good one too. I, yeah. I, I love those I love those panel shows where you guys just start ranting and then you guys yes. watch a clip and then I just see I just see Roman or Mando just cringe. It's just <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. Yes. I feel that. Yeah. It's good, it's good. That's the good part about that show. And it's, you know what? 
Watch watch Roman of the Empire's show. Don't watch the show. Watch Roman of the Empire's discussion on the show. Yeah, because you 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 see everything that needs to be seen. You you cut out basically, I don't know, 20 whole minutes of the show that you don't need to watch. You you just talk about the plot, you talk about how it's not good, and then like I I understand we say don't go watch this IP because it is bad. But then we go ahead and watch it and we go ahead and critique it. It's because we know it's not going to be good. We give it a chance with episode one. We give it a chance with season one, episode one. And then we're like, oh, this is not good. But in order for me to formulate my argument on Ahsoka, I have to watch right. the entire thing. I like if, if I am going to have an, an argument for Ahsoka, I have to watch the entire series, and then I'll be able to say it's crap. It's kind of like yeah. I watched Game of Thrones seasons one to season eight while it was airing live. Like I watched it up to date. Season one of Game of Thrones, amazing, amazing. I yeah. loved it. Season eight, I hated it. But I had to watch. I, I had to see how bad they were going to butcher well, it. You know what? We're the we're the people that are uh, doing the reviews on this stuff. We're basically the new wave of movie critics, movie yeah. and TV critics. So it, it's basically our job to watch this stuff, so you don't have to. Mm-hmm. Very well put. But speaking what? of that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stomach season two of Rings of Power, let alone oh, like no. I, 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 ugh, I I started to watch season two of Wheel of Time. <laughs> I had to stop. I had to stop. I yeah. couldn't do it. I, I just I think it's perfectly fine to not finish a series. If you don't like it, it's perfectly fine. If 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 you don't like episode one of the of the new season. You can stop watching it and say, I'm not going back to that trash. The yeah. pain is real, Ark. Absolutely. Definitely. I can see it on your face, Roman. <laughs> um, and and I, it's I just... Can... Uh. Look, th this is Roman. This is Roman right here. You were this close to losing your... That's, yeah, that's exactly Roman right there. But I, I like I don't know if I'm gonna be able to watch season two of Rings of Power. It's so bad. Oh. So bad. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it's like taking taking uh the canon and taking the lore and just setting that aside. Like take everything that Tolkien wrote and set it aside for a second. It's just bad. It's bad in general. Like I think that most of the time I give I give things like the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, maybe it can't be that bad. Maybe it, it, it's yeah. not going to um, just destroy something. Uh, no, no. Yeah. I, I watched the first season of Wheel of Time. I didn't understand it. I read the I've read the first book for Wheel of Time. Very good. I, I want to continue, but I also want to just pace myself because there's there's only one series for that. They're not making any more. I want to pace myself and enjoy it. So I've only watched the uh, read the first book and I've watched the first season. And when I read the book, yes, it was a little confusing, but I really enjoyed the first book. When I watched the first season of Wheel of Time, I, it was so confusing. I lost interest. I lost interest yeah. like a quarter of the way through. And I don't know why I finished the first season. I have no idea why I did. I just, it was just, oh, let's just go to the next episode. Oh, this is boring. Skip, 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 skip. Oh, this yeah. is kind of interesting. Oh, wait, no, it's immediately more boring than before, even though you almost had my interest for like a split yeah. second. And I'm not even going to go back and revisit the first season of uh rings of power i'm not gonna i'm not putting myself through that torture again and i'm no. probably just gonna completely skip season two um 
if anybody invites me on to like a panel show of Rings of Power, I'm going to say, okay, I'll join, but I won't know anything about it. So whatever you tell <laughs> me is probably just going to make me cringe and die like uh, on, on a live stream. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard to, to know the first season was terrible and you've reviewed it, but you, you just know the next season is just going to be as terrible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so. to me, it's like they just, the creators of those two shows, just of Rings of Power and Wheel of Prime, they like just read an overview. I mean, Wheel of, Wheel of, uh, Wheel of Time, it's like they just read an overview of it and didn't mm -hmm. actually read the book. And they didn't so, read so, anything about the characters. They didn't read anything right. about the setting. They just got the names. Right. And then they just made their own story. And the uh, Rings of Prime is even worse. They don't even mm -hmm. have a story. They just have a, a, a place in time and names. And that's pretty much all they've all they've got. The rest is just made pretty up. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. And it's such a disservice to uh, Christopher Tolkien, first off, and that that Christopher Tolkien is John Tolkien's son. Uh, see, and I say that because John Tolkien always had the Silmarillion and the, the other tales in the back of his mind when he was creating all of his works pertaining to middle earth always, but John passed away and then it was posthumously edited and published by Christopher Tolkien and Christopher Tolkien was a literary scholar in his own right. Yeah. And he also was a loving son that wanted to protect his father's legacy and wanted to just add more to middle earth, more to his father's legacy. Like just like, okay, these are letters and notes that I have compiled together and tried to make a coherent story to the best of my ability. And I'm going to call it the Silmarillion. And then every preceding book, like every, every book after this is going to be, a part of the history of middle earth. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And that's what I'm going to protect my father's legacy with. And yeah. I, I have a great respect for Chris. And now that he's passed away, like you, like when he turned over, like when he stepped down from being the head of the Tolkien estate and he turned the reins over to the grandson and he really kind of like went to the, to the like stepped aside to the back yeah, you could see that with all of the um, like deals that were made. Like, there's no way in hell that Chris would have agreed to no. let Amazon make that. There's no yeah, way. No way. And then he dies in 2020, and then they release a new book. "Quote unquote," written by John Tolkien, his father, and then they go and release the Rings of Power. And just recently, in 2022, they released another book, "Quote Unquote," written by J.R.R. Tolkien. It's just now they're just oh. taking they're taking the letters and notes of Tolkien and they're using it however they see fit. That's yeah. that's what they're doing. And they're they're now they're taking those words and they're using it for profit, because why why would you let a mega corporation like rings like uh, uh like Amazon create the rings of power if it wasn't because they offered you a boatload of cash, right? Like that's that's the only way that I can think that they would go ahead and sell their their uh, grandfather or their great grandfather's work off to uh, Amazon. And yeah. it, it is like, we were talking about Hitchcock this, this episode. And I don't think Hitchcock would have sold his prized possessions to another company so that they could go ahead and do whatever they wanted. No, he would have done it himself and he would have done it the way that he saw fit. 
right. and it, it would have turned out way better in my opinion. Like yeah. I, I can't, I can't say that for sure because he never did that. But I think that if you are the creator of an IP, you have a better chance of creating a better product than somebody that you just sell it to. And yeah. it's a, it's a damn shame when you sell it to people that don't give a shit about your IP. They just give a shit that there's a large fan base. Like Alfred yeah. Hitchcock has a and large how much fan money base. they can make. Mm-hmm. Like like we like I I learned today from you Jacob that Rear Window had a remake with Christopher Reeves. I've never heard of that until tonight, and I don't really want to watch it because I've seen the original and I like the original more. Yeah. Yeah. So, and to, uh, I, I hate the way these big corporations have taken, they, they get people to give their show credibility, like Shippy. And uh, what's the guy's name that finished off the Wheel of Time after uh, uh, Robert Jordan died? That would have been Brandon Sanderson. Yeah. Brandon Sanderson. They, mm -hmm. and uh, Disney got uh, George Lucas. And uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, the guy that created Marvel. One of the what's his name? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Darn what it, what is his name? I'm getting a brain freeze now. Fooey. Uh, Stan Lee, Stan Lee, and they, they like get these people to you know, uh, give their the new stuff credibility and when they're done with them they just throw them under the bus oh like disney and and actually marvel in and of itself they used stan lee's name that's all they did yeah they used his image and they completely tarnished it in my opinion like they they abused yeah. an old man and stole his fortune yeah and then they go so far as to to sell stuff on his twitter page mm -hmm. a dead man's and Twitter page, they sell stuff on that on that page now. And it's like, Ugh. how how do you protect something that you've created? Now, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you can't because times change and cultures shift. No, no, you should be able to like we, we don't change the Mona Lisa. Now, of course, there no, are no. renditions of the Mona Lisa. Like there's always like a meme portrait of the Mona Lisa, but that's but we not don't, changing we don't the take original. The, uh, we don't take the original and add to it, you know? Yeah. And what they've, I think the most criminal thing that Rings of Power did, it wasn't to Galadriel's character. What they did to her was awful. Yes. But I think what they did to Sauron was even worse because he is supposed to be the second in command to the worst being ever created and it wasn't yeah. like the uh, melkor which is sauron's like boss to all yeah. of you people that don't follow lord of the rings uh melkor was not created evil but he chose to be evil and sauron yeah. wasn't created evil he chose to be evil and it was because melkor deceived sauron in his own right but like what they did to Sauron was just criminal. They made yeah. him, they made him into a wimp. Yeah, and and made him have a romance with the, with Gladriel. Why? He's Why not... that 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 question? I asked that question about a million times as I watched season one, and I'm probably going to ask it so much more if big like gigantic bold letters on if if i watch uh season two which i'm not looking forward to at all i wasn't looking forward to season one either but season two and and now that i'm, I'm seeing the reports come out of season two and after watching season uh season two episode one of wheel of time amazon is is just defunct on on good writers on good directors they have no oversight and they have no quality control. Like you would think that there would be somebody's job is to go around and watch like 
watch the show before the show's released and say, hey, uh, this is not good. You need to change it. You, you think there would be a job for that. If you want Amazon, yeah. if you're watching this, go ahead and hire me. You can reach out to me. It's very easy to do. My DMs are open. You reach out to me. You don't have to pay me a lot of money. Just pay me something, and I'll tell you if your product is trash or not. Please. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there. I found the. Uh, I probably won't be able to play the sound, but it's like it's it's a. Uh, you remember the movie uh, Snow White and the Huntsman? Yes, Chris Hemsworth in that that movie. Uh huh. It was abysmal. I I I didn't like it at all. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't that big of a, wasn't that great. But she's talked. Uh, Kristen, uh, Christine Stewart is that her name? Uh, that played yes, Snow White. So. Mm -hmm. It's talking about Snow White and her purity and all this, and that you know she's put into a dangerous world. And she has to hold on to those those things that make her Snow White. Oh, this and then it cuts. Then it cuts to the new person that's playing Snow White. That's she's not white. You know, trashing it like, oh, it's uh -huh. it's not nineteen thirty seven anymore. But yeah, oh, it this just, ought to just be good. Speaks. I don't know if I can share it though. I may not be able to share the sound, but I'll, I'll give it. a Make for Give sure you check shot. the box when it when it pops up to share the screen. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, you know what? I may not be able to play it because it's I'm not on uh, Chrome. Let's see. I'm I'm still gonna try it. See if it works. Uh, let me know if you can hear it. I don't know if it'll come through or not. Can you hear it? Nope. I cannot. Nope. Ah, uh, phooey. Yeah, it won't work on Firefox for some reason. But yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually on my uh, Twitter page, so if, if anybody wants to Here, watch it, um, just, it just see. shows the see. craziness of how things have changed in just such a short time. That that movie came out in 2012, and not that long later, this this stuff is happening. Let me Crazy. see. All right, boom. We'll take it here. We'll go here. Uh, bring this out. Um, how do I? Yes, click this. There we go. Full screen. Perfect. Show. Click. Uh, share. Share the screen. Uh, what do I want to do? Uh, this one. All right, Jacob, go ahead and pull my screen up. And hopefully I did it right. Let me know if you can hear this. Everybody knows that she's... Yeah. I think everybody knows that her basic characteristic is that she's very compassionate and that she cares about people and sort of that she's like ultimately selfless. And so to put that character that we all know really well in a dangerous world and see if she can stay that way and not obviously not just die, but also not become hardened, um, really kind of maintain that heart. Um, I think it's really female. I think to play an action movie that's really kind of like in your face and loud and um, I think it's wrong. I think it's that's kind of the opposite of girl power. I think that she is like essentially female because she's steady through and through. You said you were bringing a modern edge to it on stage. What do you mean by that? I just mean that it's no longer 1937. And we absolutely wrote a Snow White. She's that is not going to be yeah. saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince. And she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. Well, I think everybody knows. Wow. Wow. Okay. 
Now that that was a good video that that portrays, and it also shows like Kristen Stewart, like how kind of crazy she's gotten if she says this yeah. now, like back then, and then you look at what she's saying now, and yeah, yeah, it, it just shows the cultural shift in in Hollywood and cinematography. Of course, you're gonna see that, but that is. That's not good if you have actresses well, that want to change, like, classic stories. It's not good. Or no. actors in general. It's it's shoving politics into movie making and storytelling, which doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's never worked. It's never going to work. I mean, there's you can tell a story about politics within a movie and in a a uh, certain culture or something, but you can't take your your modern politics and just shove it into everything. Mm-hmm. But. It's 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 a very very good way to not have a successful film. Have a film that later on in in life, like when we're looking back on this, when we're looking back on this history, it's a good way to get made fun of later on in the future. And yeah, it's it's gonna like all of this is going to be uh, lessons. You're going to study these films and how it's basically going to be a how not to make a film. Right. Right. Yep. And you, you know, there's, you, you got, I think you can't just bash the bad stuff nonstop. You know, you have to show what's good along with the bad. Do you know what I mean? So, so people can can see why this was bad and why this was good. You know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean. Yep. Well, Ark, it's been a good time. I'm glad you yes, you were sir. able to come on and hang out and talk about this stuff. It's great. Anytime, anytime, Jacob. All right, man. So, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yes, sir. Get, get, get you on again and talk about some good stuff. Stuff that uh, that I've actually watched more of, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> later, Roman. Have a good one. And thanks to everybody in the chat for hanging with us. And uh, it's been a good time. And. Everybody stay good, and see y'all next time. Later. Later.